All right. Next up, we've got Adrian Lambert. Hey, Adrian. Hi, Chris. How are you? Good, thanks. So give us a little background on yourself. Well, I'm a senior journalist by day, and I would say I'm more like a CG trainer slash filmmaker by night. I'm basically using my free time to uh, work on my short films and tutorials and share that with people, really. And I've been working in the VFX industry for the past seven years in companies such as Industrial Light and Magic, Weta Digital, um, Digi Picture. I had a really fun time. And by the end of last year, I kind of decided to put everything I learned into a short film and try to also create some content like tutorials, this kind of stuff. So it's very different from what I'm used to, but I really enjoy it. And um, yeah, um, I will probably go back to production when everything's back to normal, kind of missing the rush of deadlines and delivering shots, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Right so uh, what's the presentation today going to be on? So today we're going to talk about environment within Houdini and how to make good use of procedural to speed up workflows. So that's not really how I used to work in companies, but it's actually how I'm, I'm working uh, on my different projects. So we'll see a couple of them and how I use Houdini like to make them. All right, I'm looking forward to it. Let's jump in. Hi everyone, welcome in this presentation about cinematic environment creation. I'm going to walk you through a couple of personal projects that, as you can guess, focus on environment created within Houdini. I'm making this on my laptop, so we are far from big VFX companies' resources, which kind of forced me to find ways to optimize the scenes and renders as best as possible. We'll talk about the different steps of the creation process, from modeling to final image. We are starting with my latest illustration that I called Unexpected Path, for some reasons. Well, it was mostly a great way to experiment complex scattering of instances. It allowed me to crash test an HDAI called AL Advanced Scatter that you can find on my Gumroad and most likely on Orbolt pretty soon. This allowed me to quickly scatter objects and distribute them on the terrain based on height, slope, noise map, object volume, attributes. So we'll see the process of making the whole scene, the different challenges I faced either technically or artistically, and how I solved them. All right, this is actually what the scene looks like inside Houdini, mostly composed of a terrain, a water plane, some VDBs for the cloud, a lot of points which represent the different geometry instances, like trees, we also have a boat and the hero tree with its root extension. All this color display may seem pretty psychedelic, but hopefully this should make sense by the end of the presentation. In terms of graph, we have here one section for the tree library, the scatter systems, the hero tree geometries, and what constitute the rest of the scene. Let's see real quick how the terrain is looking. It may seem like a big graph, but it's actually fairly simple. Gonna walk you through the different steps. This would be the cache geometry I get by the end of all these operations. I knew this would be covered with trees and water, so it wouldn't make sense to go for something too detailed, right? My goal was mainly to get the flow of the river I wanted with a bunch of different canals, and just to get the idea that you could get lost very easily in that maze. To drive the width variations along the curve of the river, I'm actually mixing two sweep operations, one with a wider shape and a second one with a thinner look. In my curve resample, I make sure I have the curfew attribute enabled, which returns the value for each point where the curve would be carved at. As soon as I plug this two sweep into a point vop, I am mixing their point position by the curfew attribute that I remap with a RAM parameter. This way I can show more or less of the second input shape and really control how I want my river to look like. So I can try to play with the curve, try to make things thinner or in the contrary make that wider. <laughs> 
One more control to get to this shape was mixing the height of the river along its profile, so we got one flat version and the original shape fed into a point vop. In this point vop, I am mixing these two guys with a profile attribute which is remapped with a ramp. This attribute was actually defined into the cross section of the sweep just by extracting the x value of the bounding box and fed into an attribute called profile. This setup allowed me to adapt the river profile from a square to something rounder with full control over the final shape. Fun stuff. Then a bit of cleaning, reverse normal and fill the caps so we got proper geometry if we need to VDB this guy. I knew at this wider area I'd like some kind of island where the hero tree would grow, so I pulled in the basic shape I made out of a resample curve, then extrude it to give some volume. Can always press enter and change the shape of the island. Want something a bit more fancy, I don't know. Yeah, I was pretty happy with the previous one actually, so. Then I needed a first layer of kernels emitting from the side of my river. So I scattered some lines and tried to distort them. It's not rocket science at all. It's actually very basic. So we got the distorted lines and resampled them to smooth the result and uh, shape them with some sweep operation and merge them back with the river. But it's not quite finished yet. There is still one more layer of tertiary canals that is driven by a procedural growth. I found this very cool technique inspired by my favorite website, the Houdini Wiki, who shared an example of solver combined with VEX to generate branching structures. The main change I made was to do a group as a growth emitter instead of using random points. I wanted the growth to come from the river, so I grouped the point emitters which were included into the volume river, which resulted in these branching structures. From here, I was ready to try things with the terrain, so I cached the geometry of this river. And we can start working on the terrain. The first thing I did was projecting my geometry on a height field and subtract it with a height field layer so I get the river carving my terrain. was a bit too sharp though, so I blurred a little bit the height field. Then I am generating a mask by height and shrinking it so I get a soft mask at the center of every island. I use this mask to add some subtle noise, irregularities and elevate the area. Same deal to refine the river, selection by height and adding noise, already much better, but we could make a secondary mask out of it to break up the bottom river. This is a final height field turned into a mesh. Of course, I didn't need that kind of resolution, so I probably reduced it to 20% to keep just the essential. And I cached this geometry, I like to keep everything cached and at a decent poly count so I can save the resource of my laptop. At this point I'm adding some extra attribute for shading and scattering. AL attribute contact is fairly simple but a useful little HDA. Basically out of this mesh I am creating an attribute called main river. One pretty handy feature is the max noise, which basically break up the fall off into something more or less noisy. Can always expand the values if needed, like an attribute transfer would do. One more contact attribute, this one is called edges. It was generated from the final cached river geometry. This one will be particularly useful to define the type of vegetation growing close to water, such as mangrove, while the area in dark would result in taller type of trees such as capox and coconut palms. After the main terrain, I position what I would call a hero mountain. I choose to make it as a separate mesh to have the freedom to fill it into my composition. I could have reprojected onto my main terrain, but I am not that picky since it will be covered with forest and fog. So quick walk through, starting with a woolly nose that fed on the borders of the height field. It gives me a decent base. Then I'm creating a mask based on the height and distort everything thanks to a whirly noise I'm feeding to a distort by layer. So this gives some nice breakup. 
And then I'm applying a bunch of different erosion. Final result with erosion and poly reduce look like this. I actually created a couple of those mountain and choose to use this one. Now that all the geometries are here, I am using an HDA of mine, AL water attributes, to generate some attribute based on the water level. So as you can see, as soon as we change the water height, we get different result. It can be pretty fun to play with, but in my case, um, I just needed the water to be around that level. Then we have the wetness attributes, which result in this kind of magenta color, and the beach attributes, which result in the green. So I would use these attributes to drive the shaders. In that case, I'm using the water level to drive how the water is absorbing some part of the diffuse. Just in case I'm generating some more water attributes based on a higher water level. And finally, caching these results. I added a null called output terrain that we would call into a scatter a bit later. The next step of this presentation could be the water. I'm gonna talk in detail about my workflow in a sec, but just let me clarify the boat situation first. Sorry to disappoint, nothing procedural, just modeled in Blender the old school way, nothing special really. Took the time to model something decent that I could reuse in other project. Now, the boat trail is actually a bit more interesting since I'm not using any fluid or FX workflow, just some procedural modeling to achieve the final wave. We are starting with the grid I'm object merging from the AL water secondary output, adding some more divisions. Now, my idea was to split one section of water based on the boat position so we can work on a small chunk of water and merge it back later with the rest of its geometry. I am actually subdividing the area where the boat is flowing in quite a lot so we can displace it with some attributes that we're gonna create. It's actually quite a lot of polygons. Well, this little cube here represents where the wave is generating. So most likely the wave would start here at the front of the boat, could still set it in other places, but wouldn't make sense, right? Next step, I'm extracting one single point out of this cube and basically copying a bent cylinder into a transform copy. For the need of my final composition, it was important for me to keep it bent. Then, out of this geometry, I am extracting some curves and generating a mesh getting wider at the end of the curves and distorting it with a mountain sop. Once I am happy with the bent shape, I am then transferring the color of this mesh onto my subdivided water. I am of course doing a bunch of operations inside my point vop to control noise variations and how the wave is fading. Finally, I am displacing this grid with this reshaped wave. Since it was a bit too sharp, I've been smoothing the position, color and wave attributes. Could try to increase it actually. And the wave shape point vob gave me control over the final result with a ramp parameter. So it's not rocket science. You would of course get better result with effects and simulations, but I didn't want to spend too much time on it. For me, it was a quick and dirty way to get something done. Finally, I am reducing the amount of polygons and caching the final geometry. So considering the distance to the camera, I think it's doing the job. This is the result with the combined geometry. As we can see, the poly reduce did a great job at keeping details wherever it was important. Could probably even reduce some more. Okay. Now that we have a terrain and river ready, it's time to grow a forest. To do so, we need some tree models that we can instance. I prepared a bunch of them inside the software speed tree. I usually like to organize my scenes into different takes so I can quickly set a state of the scene that fit best. If I want to check out the water, hero tree, a specific shot. In this case, Luke Dev is just showing up the most important tree models. One thing I like to do is ordering them either by scale, proximity to water, or altitude if I'm making mountains. Because it will give me an idea how I am going to organize the instances into my scatter system.
it's important that they have some realistic measures at the beginning. We could argue that my palm tree and kapok tree are still fairly small, but as long as they are bigger than the mangrove, that just makes sense. I also like to render them together just to compare the different shade of green trunk values. So all of these trees got model variation, so the mangrove are not exactly the same. Some are slightly smaller, some got a more or less dense foliage. You get the idea. These models were exported with groups corresponding to their shaders, so it's very easy to just apply a material per group. Then I usually like to keep a shop network inside their geo context that will contain all the textures and shading informations of that specific tree. This way, if I need to copy this model into another scene, I can just copy paste this coconut palm context and get the model and its shaders very quickly. Now, to speed up the process of applying textures and materials, I created two string parameters, tree name and path root. This way, if I decide to move the path of my texture into another location, I just need to update this path root. If I need another tree, I just change the tree name. For example, if I take the box shader inside, I made a load file tab. This reference the path that we have at the shop level here and the tree name here and here. Then box would be the description of the textures to load. And of course, the extension of the texture. If I dive in this Redshift network, all my texture nodes are referencing to the string we found in load file tab. That's where it's important to have a uniform naming convention for the textures, otherwise would make that system useless. Now, the great thing is that I don't even need to dive in my shader networks to do changes. I expose some parameters into a shader setting tab that can adjust everything from here. In that case, in the leaflet one shader, I am color correcting the diffuse a little bit and also created a cluster vector attribute, which is basically going to randomize the hue saturation lightness across the different instances. Basically, we have three variation possible, one based on the red channel of the cluster, one on the green and one on the blue. All right, now that those trees are ready, it's time to scatter them. Gonna go back to my main take. As you can see, I've got a couple of instance context, three for the trees. I choose to split between mountain, large trees and mangrove, which is basically gather the small trees. In terms of plants, we have some lotus and dead leaves scattered on the river. So to explain how I set up those guys, it's important I should start from scratch to make a demonstration. Inside of an instant context, I am using an HDIA made AL Advanced Scatter. Inside the surface scatter, I'm going to grab the output terrain we saw earlier. I now got some points scattered. I can choose to visualize this surface. I guess we could crank up the point density though. I made a specific tab to assign geometries. In here, I can set the amount of geometry I want. We're just going to try with three. And I'm going to assign some mangrove in the first lot, palm tree in the second one, and a kapok tree in the third one. One detail though, for now I still need to add the quotation mark in between the path, so these are declared as a string. So we can see the color changes, blue correspond to the third ID, as we can see in the ramp previs. By default, the density is full white, so we could start to break this up and enable height distribution. This allows me to control the altitude of my distribution. And usually I like to combine that with slope feature. If I just want to see the slope effect by itself, I can change that in this menu. And change the minimum and max angle of my slope. I'm pretty happy with that, so I can display the combined result. If I temporarily hide the surface, we can see our point distribution has been break up quite a bit. We could even try to go further by bringing some noise in this system. So classic features in here and can get less contrast by playing with min and max input. We can choose to preview this scattering. Since it's using packed and instance geometry, Houdin is going to display whatever is close to the camera and we simplify the rest as a box. I usually like to randomize the rotation Y and the scale 
we could actually also control the scale variation using the noise we set up. Let's try to change the minimum scale. We're actually going to also change the density so we see what's going on. In that case, smaller trees are more dense and larger trees are sparser. One way to break up the ID distribution would be to bring the minimum ID to zero. Gonna reduce the overall scale. Now, if we enable ID variation, we can actually see the different shape of our trees. I don't enable it by default because it can get slow pretty quickly with that feature enable. Mostly depends on your amount of points. By default, our mangrove is red, but you can assign a different color for display. I personally prefer keeping things with pure RGB values, so I can always identify the different type of vegetation, even if I'm not seeing the shape. So I know that mangrove will be red, coconut is green, and kapok is blue. Now, if this is disabled, we'll only previous the scattering with the first ID the mangrove. One way to work on large-scale environment like this one is to work on a section of a forest using object distribution. You can plug an object into the HDA and use its volume to control the scattering. As soon as we change the size, it's applying a density of zero to whatever is outside the sphere. You can also do some falloff and or remove the center if we want. By isolating a portion of forest, it's actually faster to see the full display of the scattering. Since we have less points to compute, it's going faster. Now, just for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to disable this noise and I'll rather use an attribute we cached on our terrain. We could try with the edge attribute we generated with AL contact. We can remap this attribute to contrast it. We could try and bring some other attributes such as water, beach or main river. So the great thing is, with this attribute, I can use it to drive the IDs. We now get mangrove closer to the river. If I'd like to randomize the GeoIDs a little more, I set up some parameters into the Object to Scatter tab. Let's say we want to scatter the Kapok distribution. We could set this slider to 100% and this ramp would control which specific IDs you'd like to replace. At this point, it's just overriding the palm trees, but if I flatten the curve, it's going to replace everything with this ID. Let's say we want 5% randomization, could do the same with the palm trees. If I set to 100%, we still have the 5% palm trees unless we change that to zero and we got only palm trees. Same deal with the first ID with the mangrove. So this setup gave me the flexibility to really control how I wanted my forest to look like. For my final scattering, I actually used the edges attribute as a base, but I also brought breakups with a custom map. Can do that with the map distribution. Let's disable those guys just so we can see what's going on and let's enable the map distribution. Well, by default, this is the main drill peak of Houdini's library. We can actually change which channel to use if this is a color texture. Also, if you don't have UVs or want to change them, you can still uncheck use existing UVs. Let's change this texture, maybe a checkboard, so we can see a bit more clearly how this is affecting the distribution can do all the UV operation, rotate, offset. Well, it's interesting, but wouldn't use a checkboard textures, right? Would rather use some kind of grunge pattern to break things up. Let's move on. Time to talk about clusters for material. So by default, we have a noise driving some IDs, classic parameters for the noise would make sure that we can see some red, green, and blue, so we get some nice variations into the shaders. I also made a menu just to be able to see the distribution of the different channels of the clusters. As I said before, this attribute would be used into the tree materials to control the different variations. We just need to make sure that the name of the attribute match 
with the one set into the AL scatter. And as soon as we change the hue, saturation and lightness of this different channel, it's going to affect the look of the shaders. Just making sure the name is the same than in the shader, that's good. This is kind of deprecated, but could also assign the cluster attribute to the geometry IDs. So I launched a render real quick with the object distribution enable, and we're going to also activate the cluster, and I'm going to reduce the number object to one so that we see what's going on with just one mangrove. And well, I got an overall control over hue saturation lightness. So I'm just going to reset that. And what I want to change is, uh, let's say, the saturation in red and green channel of the cluster. Now we start to see variation appearing over the single geometry. One last thing I did was making an option to change the surface channel display. So I can still visualize the P scale values, ID distributions, colors. This way, even though my scatter preview is an enable, I can still try things quickly and see how using another feature would affect this channel. In terms of preview, this is either using a copy stamp with packed primitive or for each loop to assign the GeoIDs. I noticed that one can work a bit faster than the other in some situation, so just keeping that as an option. Now, when it comes to rendering, just making sure to turn off scattering preview and visualize surface. Ideally, I will script something so this is automatically disabled when leaving the context, but, well, for now, that will do the trick. Now, one thing I would like to talk about is the vegetation floating on the river. To scatter them, I did a quick setup with a boolean. I am using the intersection of the water grid with the main river geometry. Then I'm remeshing it to get a uniform density of points I could paint on. And I am using the, an attribute paint. As soon as I press enter, I can start painting the area where I want my vegetation. In the attribute tab, we can see that this was painted on an attribute called mask that I'm going to load into my scatter. So I was looking for some very specific shape and there was no way I could have done that without painting attributes. So in my dead leaf scatter, we can see I'm using the custom geo output river I just showed you, scattering one single object and let's display the surface actually. And I am calling the mask into the attribute distribution tab. So I painted two different masks to make a distinction between the red leaves and the green lotus that is floating on the river. Otherwise, I did some basic randomization over the rotation and the scale. We could actually relax the position of the points so they would feel more on the water surface. And that's pretty much it. So this is what I get when trying to render the look dev water take and could actually enable the cluster on that guy so we have some subtle variation and that will do. Last important thing to talk about for this project would be the hero tree. I'm gonna set my tech to hero tree look dev. So the first element is the base tree created in speed tree. The vines come also from the speed tree models. Just exported those separately so I can use it in a scatter system. We got this node output vines that I can use to reference as a surface scatter. So I'm basically calling it inside this advanced scatter, mostly using some noise breakups for the leaf IDs and scattering three different leaves geometry to bring some variations. For the root extension, I modeled a basic surface that I could use as a cage to drive their direction. I modeled it in a way that is following the shape of the islands because I wanted the roots to wrap around this forest and did a bunch of modification like mountain and VDBs to make it look more interesting. And I used an HDA called IV Timing, a tool developed by Mark Chevry, aka MC WorldKit, I just got rid of the leaves and walked on the vines using some of the procedural settings such as randomness, spread angles. 
When I was happy with the result, I finally cached it. So in terms of shaders, I basically reused what I set up with the tree library. I just wanted a trunk that looks like a eucalyptus, so something pretty bright. And um, from there, I could play with the cluster attribute to bring some variation into the leaves so that it's not too even and basically playing with the saturation, really, and the lightness. Didn't spend too much time, just wanted something that holds up in the distance. All right, it's time to optimize things a little bit, especially the amount of instances, which can go pretty high depending on what you are doing. I added a camera calling function to the AL scatter so that I can remove everything that is outside the camera which is a great way to get rid of unnecessary object and if you want to play it safe, you can increase the cold padding. If we compare the number of instances, we are at 150k thanks to this feature. Otherwise, the whole scatter would be around 750k instances, which can get even higher with all the other scatters. I'm finally caching the scatter system, so this gets faster to load. And I'm only launching on one frame, but would totally cache a specific frame range if I had an animation. For this trick, I must especially thank SwadiniSource.com and their great tutorials article about culling points in camera view. In brief, they are showing how to use a UV texture node to create an attribute based on a camera projection and use it with some vex to get rid of the points outside the camera. So big thanks for any source. I highly commend their tutorial and look forward to seeing some more resources on this website. In terms of lighting, I wanted a result that looks like a broad daylight. The problem being, how do you make an afternoon light interesting? With a sunrise or sunset, you can use the long shadows cast by the object to help the composition. But you cannot really do that with an afternoon light. It can be hard to make daylight seem interesting unless you start adding some shadows cast by the clouds. So let's add some clouds. I added some VDB shapes that I manually placed to drive wherever I wanted to focus the light in the frame. I wanted to drive the eyes in two places, toward the boat and toward the weeping tree. If we compare before after, it does look better and most importantly, it helps telling a story. One more thing is I created some layers of cloud or smoke, whatever this is, it's here to help getting a better silhouette of the hero tree. So you don't want to have that everywhere, of course, but just like the light, you want it in some places that make sense with your story. To have some more control in comp, I separated that in different layers I could play with in case I would need to crank up one more than the other, for example. So let's look at the renders. In this one, we get some interesting silhouettes of the trees and how the smoke is creeping into the branching rivers. Let's load all the others. This one would help supporting the tree and the mountain in background. Well, that's a god ray pass, because why not? So here is a beauty render. I usually like to keep it flat in terms of contrast, just to get more control in comp. Then starting the compositing infusion, I'm comping a background sky and starting to bring the light up. Next phase is adding the different volumes together. We are still in a pretty flat situation. So from here, I like to export the result into Lightroom to work on the grade, like I would do with my photos, really. And I ended up with this look. You can also experiment different grading. At some point, I was leaning towards something like this, but decided to go back to this afternoon vibe with a touch of fantasy. And this concludes this part about this illustration. So we're gonna have a look at another project, a Tyrion workflow experiment. 
I made a whole series of tutorials on my YouTube. It's also available on SideFX website for free. I'm gonna try to spend the next 10 minutes to sum up two hours and a half of videos. That's pretty intense, so I'm just going to explain the main approaches of every step. I won't go deep into detail, but if you are interested in knowing more, I definitely invite you to check them out later. If you've already seen them, well, it can still be a cool little reminder. The main idea was to use this location of New Mexico called Shiprock as a base for a little concept of twirling mountains. I usually like to collect a bunch of photos to identify the different features I'm going to need to integrate into my terrain. In a nutshell, we'll have the terrain A, which would be the main terrain in foreground. We'll need to add a dune on this terrain, we can R direct to fit the composition. On this dune we'll have a natural wall formation to develop and Tyrain B, which will be the hero mountain in center of the composition. And finally, Tyrain C and D for the most distant terrains. So this is the final terrain I made. In my opinion, the biggest mistake when it comes to terrain generation is trying to put everything we see in the landscape into the same height field or same mesh, which can take a lot of resource and is unnecessary a flexible approach on controlling environment. So here is a little time lapse of the different step in making the terrain B. So mostly starting with a mask generated from a sphere and applying some height field noise to give a basic shape. Then adding some more wally noise to get some interesting ridges. Also, I like to use a Voronoi pattern to break up the base of the mountain. Once I'm happy with the silhouette, it's time to erode it and basically getting rid of the bottom section to isolate the main mountain. I'm then caching the geometry. Out of this height field, I'm slicing a section of it so I can reproject it as a mask on my terrain A. Blurring this mask and adding some patches of noise, I can then apply a height field noise to elevate this portion of terrain. From here, I like to try some subtle distortion so it feels more organic. Also cracking the base of the mountain with some distorted Voronoi pattern that I mask with a mask by feature. To twist the terrain A around terrain B, I'm converting terrain A into a mesh and extracting the group of point intersection with terrain B. I can then use this group into a soft transform to rotate the base of the mountain and give this twisted look. Then reprojecting this mesh on a height field and also adding the tiering B uh, portion on top of it so it feels more connected later on. Time to have a look at the dune, which is the topic of the part 2 of the tutorial series. In here I made a little HDA, the dune maker that is based on the curve input and turn it into some kind of ridge geometry. So, taking advantage of procedural feature to drive the looks of this dune. To cut a long story short, this is based on a simple sweep operation with some control over the cross section, then creating a couple of attributes to drive how this shape is spreading along the curve. In my workflow, I am then reprojecting this mesh on a height field to access the awesome erode node and give a more natural look to this dune can always change the color of the erosion to give an idea what the look dev could look like. So apply this ID on the terrain A. These are the different tests of erosion I got. One great thing about the erode node is that you can always do some mask if you want for example more or less precipitation in one area or vary the amount of sediment thermal erosion across the terrain, it's all possible. After that, it's pretty much time to export the terrain. Just another example explaining this workflow. I created an HDA called Terrain Exporter that allowed me to export a split version of the terrain into an optimized mesh with its corresponding UDIM. I am creating two of those, one to export a high-res version and one for a low-res model. Can always control the final density of the mesh thanks to a poly reduce and use the lab auto UV to unfold a better version of UVs automatically, 
we could use those to back some utility maps. I also have the control over exporting the erosion channels such as water, debris, bedrock, etc. And it's going to export everything for each tile with a consistent naming. This is how I was able to extract this erosion information and a mask layer for the dune I could reuse during the look dev. In this case, I was showing in part 5 how to reproject those texture on the new UVs and sketch a look for this terrain in real time with Substance Painter. Having the flexibility to quickly export a high-res and a low-res version from Houdini allowed me to bake some cool details on the normal maps. There is actually just a few thousand polygons, but it looks pretty detailed. One other utility node is load terrain to load all this tile into a combined mesh and be able to swap the display from low-res to high-res geometry which is great to mock up a camera animation or use for previs and quickly swap for a production-ready environment. The part 3 of the tutorial series was explaining in detail the wall creation. In brief, I'm extracting a mask based on the original path of the dune, I reshape the height field to isolate this section and converting it into a mesh and deleting the points of the ground. Then I'm doing a selection by normal to keep the top faces. I can then refine this strip we get with a resample and a remesh sop. To start shaping the wall, I am extruding this base and creating some attributes to drive the height of this extrude. We have here some RAM control for the global shape and one additional noise to control some more organic breakups. For a second layer of breakup, I am scattering sphere on the wall that I use as a boolean and deform the shape of this sphere to add irregularities. In the end, I'm converting this wall into a VDB to get a clean mesh and add some surface detail. This is the result I got inside the master scene. So having this kind of procedural control in production is very beneficial because if all of a sudden we need some changes on this dune, well, at least the wall can adapt and it's just a few clicks to update that. This part four of the series was mostly about atmospheric lighting using Mantra. But those principles would also apply with any other engine, of course. So I started by setting up the key light, doing some exploration, and setting up a box we could fill with fog. I created a RAM control for the fog height. And another one for the distance. From there, I mostly played with the light and fog color to find an interesting balance. But at some point, I just wanted to break up the uniform light with some fake cloud. So I made some flat cloud geometry, uh, starting from a circle and deforming it, that I could use as a gobo and scattering those into a volume of a box, then playing with the seed of the scatter and the transform of the copies to position my cloud shadow into specific portion of the landscape. This was the result I got, was trying to make it look a bit dramatic. Finally, the part 6 was mostly about material, so I'm showing how to set up the shaders with the tile texture exported from Substance Painter in part 5. We have the diffuse, IOR, specular, roughness and normal. We can also notice that the normal map, once applied on the shader, are applied into the viewport display, which is pretty handy. A little extra thing is also about using terrain attributes into the shading system with the bind nodes. Basically using the AL water I showed you earlier to create some attributes and I could reuse those to remap my diffuse a bit better. So once set, we can call them into a bind node, combine different attributes and refit the final value to control the gamma, for example. Could be the hue, the saturation, also, I'm using TechList to try different lighting situations and test the look depth. 
So these sum up the main ideas behind those tutorials, so I invite you to check them out if this is something that can interest you. Thrive in Silence was another illustration done in Houdini Redshift. Mostly it was a great way to experiment procedural on some kind of architectural scene, especially for generating arches and all those bricks. I like to explore different compositions and sometimes having the ability to change a feature like the height of the scene really makes a difference in terms of workflow. We have also the radius of the dome. Doing that kind of changes in a traditional workflow can be pretty time consuming. So in brief, how this work is pretty basic. There's almost no coding, just some basic sub operations, some expressions here and there. We have a grid of point that I connect and deform to get this arch look. I'm starting with an octagon that represents the arch intersection that I copy on every point of this grid and I link the closest points together. For every primitive generated, I'm looping in them, doing a resample with curfew attribute exported, and control the final shape from a point vop. This way, if I want to change the roundness of my base structure, I can just use this RAM parameter and tweak it to adjust the shape. Just for the sake of demonstration, this would apply on everything, of course. Then I'm looping again through every primitive, but this time I'm splitting in several sections that represent the bricks by using a group by range. The cool thing is as soon as I polywire these curves, we get this brick kind of look. I'm also generating some edge breakups just by mixing the same geometry with two different polybevel distance values. As you can see, one is very sharp, while the other is wider with a different shape profile. And as soon as I mix them into a point vop with some turbulence, we get something that already looks much more detailed. And this is the kind of thing that would take forever to sculpt, so this method allow me to create a bunch of very unique bricks super quickly. Now for the ceiling, I'm sure there are some smarter way to proceed, but I guess everything got a more or less fancy solution. How I did was just using my base grid, poly extrude all those faces into their centers, and we get this cross shape. I resampled those and projected them on the arch lines I set up, So this is before after projection. This already give me a decent result, but could use some topology help with a remesh sub. Beautiful. Now I'm redoing another projection on the main lines. So we get the proper shaping. Then the topology is a bit funky. So from there, I'm extruding this surface and converting it into a VDB. At the same time, I'm taking this opportunity to make a hole in the ceiling based on my dome position. Basically, I'm converting the base dome into a VDB and doing a SDF difference into a VDB combine. It would be the equivalent of booleans for VDB. And then I'm converting this into a mesh. Then starting to merge the different elements together, we have this dome thingy that was generated from the cylinder I showed you. Just keeping a portion of it that I duplicate and rotate randomly in Y. Giving some thickness with poly extrude, some more edge treatment with noisy bevels. And finally merging an inside geo for what would be the motor. Can always change the amount of rows if needed. So the position of this guy isn't random, it's defined right at the beginning and can be changed with this dome position subnetwork. All it does is simplifying the grid into possible options and using a group by range to pick up a position that would fit inside the room. Now for the columns, I basically control the shape from a point vop. So I can just tweak this ramp parameter to push in or push out the polygons of my columns. Then I'm basically 
positioning some box with a match size. So that can help as a support kind of thing. Now for the IV, I'm reusing the IV timing, the HDA developed by Mark Chevry. I cannot recommend this tool enough since it's really handy and runs perfectly. Now it just needs a bit of preparation to optimize the volume to specify. I wasn't going to feed the whole room inside this tool. So I did a basic representation of the elements I wanted my IV to grow on. To do so, I isolated this portion of scene and made a subnetwork that blasts all the elements outside of the limit of the box. I usually pack everything first with an assemble node and using a group by object pointing at this box to only include whatever is in there. This way, I just need to change the exposed parameter to specify the walkable area for IV. Then I'm just adding some extra elements to turn that into a VDB. And now, as soon as I use this IV HDA, it's doing some magic and can of course quickly iterate on the look. Pretty fun stuff to experiment. Practically, I'm also growing a secondary IV based on the bottom of the columns. So we get these cool vines. So how to specify where it grows is just some points scattered on the columns and deleting the points that have a height greater than one in that case. Now, can play with the IV timing to get more or less crazy results and have those IV fit onto the columns. This is actually a pretty fun and interactive way to generate this kind of detail. And it's very tempting to just add IV everywhere, really. Okay, let's move on. As you can see, my pillars are instanced. That's why we are seeing this box display. Trying to save some resource here and there. And same goes for these torches in the back. I really wanted to add some touch of warmth coming behind the hero tree and having this kind of medieval torches in the back was just the perfect object. Even though we don't end up really seeing these guys in the final composition, I still like bringing realism into whatever I'm doing and maybe I will have another pass at this scene and try a different composition later. Also, I could point out that this asset is fully procedural. In this context, it's not super useful. I wouldn't do that in a real production if I only have one type of torch to make. But I thought that could be an interesting topic for a tutorial, so why not? I actually made a two-part tutorial on my YouTube channel about making this type of procedural asset. So you can find that among some other things on my YouTube. You'll see in detail how to set up this model with all parameters and settings possible to customize its look. It's a pretty fun way to approach procedural modeling. Time to have a look at the look dev. We could start with the floor. I wanted some pavement with water puddles, so I had to set up something quick in terms of model so we could have the water level affect the shader and get on one hand the diffuse and reflection absorbed by the puddles and on the other hand the wetness that still shines above the water surface. At this time I didn't have my AL water tool so I was basically importing the water on one side, my floor on the other and creating some displacement irregularities on the floor with some noise and custom paint. So this is a basic displace along normal. And in another point vop, I'm creating a water attributes to handle the shader. In brief, I'm comparing the Y values of my floor with the Y values of the water to return a value of zero or one and export that into a custom attribute. Now, if I play with this elevation parameter, this changes the water level and how the shader is dealing with water absorption. Then I'm adding the tree model I made in speed tree and the leaves. Don't ask me what's my thing about pink trees, I really have no idea at this point. Then I'm adding the ivy 
and also scattering some of the leaves on the ground to add some extra detail. From there, adding the main archway structure. In terms of shader, I have basically some triplanar setup with procedural operations to drive the base of concrete look. And I'm blending this base shader with a moss mask that I made out of curvatures, occlusion, and errors noise. So all of this is blended into a material blender where base color is connected to the base concrete and the layer color one is pointing toward a very simple moss shader. The mask and bump is doing most of the job here. Now, if we add the rest, it's getting pretty dark. So lighting could use some more love here. I worked with an area light and some volume to get this beam of light. Also added some more iris light to help creating some extra bounce on the columns. A touch of warm sphere lights in the back from the torches. We could argue that the water is way too clean. Maybe I'll have an overpass at some point and add some deformations and tiny debris. I tried to rebalance some shaders in comp, like the leaves which had too much transmission in my text. Did some extra work on the volume and tried to bring more contrast in general. So that was a fun little project to learn and experiment new things. Could have been done fairly easily in a more traditional way but having the flexibility to tweak and try different feature once everything is set up end up being a more creative process, in my opinion. Here comes the end of this presentation. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope it's been useful. A big thanks to Paola Catano and Chris Herbert for this wonderful opportunity to share my work with you guys. Also, a special thanks to the companies who are supporting me on my short film and tutorials like SideFX, Redshift, Speedtree and Adobe Substance. If you'd like to stay in touch, here are my contacts on social medias. I'm always interested in getting to know some passionate people about VFX, so feel free to come say hi. If you use some of my tools or tutorials in your project, I'm always happy to see the results. So see you guys around and enjoy the rest of the Houdini Hive.